insane in the end games. Now, that really hypes it up. I don't think you guys are gonna go insane from these end games that I'm about to show you, but hopefully uh, you will get uh, a deeper appreciation of endgames and especially the way that I like to talk about endgames is I like to use them as case studies of strategy. Uh, one analogy that I like to use especially with kids because I work with kids all the time is you know nobody no kids study endgames they all hate endgames right and, and you ask them you know are endgames important they're like yes of course of course do you study endgames? Oh, never like I just do openings and tactics all the time and I'm like, well, if you think it's important, why don't you study them? He's like, well, if I study an end game, what are the probabilities that I'm going to actually get it in one of my games? And they, you know, they make a pretty good argument. They say, well, if I do get it and I mess it up, maybe that's half a point or a full point that I leave on the board. And like, that's in my entire career. Like, I'll maybe get one chance. I'm like, well, that's not really the point, right? Like, you do tactics problems. They, yeah, I do tons of tactics problems. Well, you don't solve a tactics puzzle because you think you're going to get that position in one of your games, right? So it's the same thing with end games. Like you do tactics to train your calculation, you do end games to tr train your strategic understanding. So whereas tactics, it's just about being able to visualize positions and calculate your way through variations, in end games, what you're supposed to do is find ways of getting all your pieces to collaborate towards a common goal, which is basically the definition of strategy, right? So this is one of my favorite end games to try to exercise that skill. It's a, it's a very famous theoretical end game. It's called the Philidor end game. It's one of Philidor's many end games that he analyzed. Uh, I think it was what, like 17th century or uh, late 16th century, something like that. It's insane. Like this guy has to be top three greatest chess players of all time. He was a famous composer during his time as well. And I guess when he wasn't composing, he was just cranking out all these end games that stand until today, even though you have engines and all sorts of uh, strong grandmasters. And I think nobody can improve upon his solutions. It's just mind boggling. Anyway, this is one of his uh, famous positions. And uh, I really like it because when you find this end game in an end game book, the solution is like impossible. Uh, if you try to memorize it, it's just like trying to memorize a phone book or something like that. It's just variation after variation, very difficult. So one of the things that I like to do with end games is try to break down those long convoluted solutions and articulate it into words. Like what's really going on? So I like to divide this end game into two stages. And stage number one is going to involve dominating this rook. Domination is the holy grail of strategy. It's the process by which you gradually improve your pieces while restricting your opponents, right? In this case, black doesn't have that many pieces. So in the first part of the end game, black's rook needs to be driven from its optimal square, where it is at right now, to its worst possible square. Now, it's hard to figure out what square is actually the worst possible square. So this is where it's handy to actually know the solution beforehand because it gives you important information. Now, does anybody have any idea as to what that worst square might be for this rook? Somewhere on the back of the light square, somewhere on the, uh, the eighth rank. Somewhere on the eighth rank? That would be a good guess. Now, why? I think maybe we should start with why e7 is the optimal square. And then we can sort of reverse engineer that and, and try to deduce what the worst square would be. Yeah, in the back. In, in case there's any left checks belong to a3, the rook can block. Exactly. So what the rook on e7 allows you to do is to meet check with block. And if white doubles back and swings over to the other side, then you can also swing over to the other side and block the check again. So. Black is doing a sort of rope-a-dope, and wherever, whichever side of the board you come at him from, he's going to swing the rook and block the check that way. So this is the essence of Black's defense here. And that's why it's so important for the rook to be on e7. For example, if it were, if it were Black to move, and Black were to place the rook on the back rank, which would be really devastating, like, like you're saying, well, now I would swing over 
to the other side, and your rook can't make it in time to block the checks, so you lose the end game. So in a way, the, forcing the rook to the back rank would be ideal, but we can't actually do that uh, can't, unless black does it willingly, which would not be a good idea. It would be very cooperative of him, very thoughtful, but not very good. Another important defensive resource, you might think, well, if this is the idea, why don't I just take that square away from the rook, and now I'm threatening check. Well, here black has this very nice stalemate trick. Rook d7, and after bishop takes, this is a draw. So these two ideas are going to be the essence of black's defensive strategy, and this is what we're going to have to overcome if we want to win this endgame. So spoiler alert, the worst square for the black rook, I'm not telling you this because I don't think I could even figure this out if you gave me, like if I'd never seen this position before and you gave it to me, it would take me a million years and I probably wouldn't figure it out, is the c3 square. What? Yes. It's, it sounds ridiculous. But if we can get this black rook to c3, the game is over. And then it just becomes a matter of applying some tactical themes. And then it's just a matter, it's like a forced win. It's a matter of, of raw calculation more than really understanding where the pieces need to go. So it's a fascinating endgame <clears throat> because the first part is pure strategy <clears throat> and the second part is pure tactics. So we need to gradually push this rook closer and closer to the c3 square. And we're going to do this in stages. We're going to do this gradually. So what would be the first step? How would you guys play this endgame? Yeah, in the back. Okay, vague knowledge is great because it's usually going to get you halfway and then something bad happens and, and it falls apart. So this is where most people are, vague knowledge. Uh, so what, what is that vague knowledge? So I'm going to play rook f2 so that, we keep him with, so that we keep him away from the second ring because it's mm -hmm. the only dark square from which he can check you along the b file. Okay, so let's say after rook f2, I just may waste a tempo with my rook. Well, actually here, I might be able to, to check you, right? Uh, I don't actually have to waste a tempo. And as white, I wouldn't be particularly happy to have my king uh, dislodged from d6 because that's really an optimal square for the king. That's why it was also tempting to play bishop c6 to keep the rook at bay. Um, so, so not only is the rook ideally placed here, it's also threatening to interrupt the coordination among our pieces. Yeah? Um, so I also have a big knowledge of this end game. Uh, I actually have studied this before, but actually I've forgotten everything. <laughs> Perfect. This is my kind of crowd. Vague knowledge. I knew it, but I forgot it. So I'm actually going to be able to show you some stuff. I think this is good idea. Uh, rook, rook f8, I guess, first, and then rook e8, rook f7 will be the way that I would, I would start. Okay, great. So notice how we're making progress, right? One of the things that that you shouldn't do in end games is visualize the the end position that you want and try to get there right away because you might miss a defensive resource you might rush things and you have to be patient um, you want to really grind your opponent down you're not in a rush I mean unless you have something else you need to do that day but otherwise you know really black has no counterplay so you can take all the time in the world. Actually, not true. I remember Kaurana got this endgame against Svidler at the Candidates a few, year, uh, a few years ago. And he drew it because he was one move shy. Like he, he reached the 50 moves and he was winning on the 51st. And he makes the 50 and Svidler's like, Arbiter, uh, <laughs> bail me out, you know? <laughs> cash me in, I'm, I'm done, and he, he couldn't make it. Uh, so actually, you might have to hurry a little bit. But from, once you get to this position, it is a forced win. So he actually had to maneuver a lot to get here, and that's what really did him in. Uh, because the end game is technically a draw if you don't get here. Uh, so what were you saying after you, you get the seventh rank? Then what do you do? Well, <laughs> What does black do, actually? What is white threatening? Ken? What is white threatening? Yes, you got this. Uh, bishop to c6. And if rook h8? 
Remember what the purpose of the rook on e7 was, why that was the perfect square, and why this is less than perfect. What is the essence of black's defense? What is that rook supposed to be able to do? Well, why, what does e7 allow you, allow you access to simultaneously? It allows you to shuttle back and forth between the king side and the queen side. So, for example, if you get checked here, you can block here. But if you get checked here, you need to be able to block here. So white is actually threatening to swing the rook over and mate you. So, for example, if you were to make a random move here, like rook h8, this would be losing. Because now after this, you can't block the check in time. You can give a check, but then I block it and you're done. Right? So. How can black solve this problem? Fortunately, it's black to move, so it's not quite over yet. King c8, King c8 and what if I... Um... Right, because if I go here, then you might have this check still. So maybe throwing in this in-between check. Uh, works right because if king d8 then I get to play rook a7 so you would you have to go king b8 rook b7 now if I go here I'm gonna lose the rook so I have to go back to c8 and now rook here so I'm threatening bishop e6 followed by rook b8 and if check king c6 and here oh this is gonna be a close one Rook a1, and because uh, if I go here, again, I lose, right? So I have to go here. Then king attack the rook? Yeah, right? Attack the rook in here. So this looks like a win. So what does black have to do? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, any kind, of, any kind of move that would allow this rook to swing over and cover the c8 square. We're going to see that our goal is to actually trace the path of this rook. We want it to go first to e8, so we pick up the seventh rank. Then we want to force it to e3, and then we want to force it to c3. So we're going to slowly nudge it in the direction that we want it. So first things first, step one, we pick up the seventh rank. Now, if black is cooperative, you will play rook e3, and when we swing the rook over, the rook swings over, and we get the rook to where we want it. Don't ask me why it's bad on c3. We're going to get around to that in just a moment. But for now, take a leap of faith and trust me that this is a terrible square for the black rook. So assuming that, let's say that black just moves the rook as far away as possible. Generally, a good policy for the rook. Right, so after rook e1, oops, white wastes, uh, actually I have rook e2 as the main move because uh, rook h7 is the main move because rook e2 is actually a very good square for this rook. Uh, and e1 is not as good, actually. The reason for that is, again, solely based on the assumption that we want to get this rook to e3, is that if I swing the rook over, and now you swing the rook over to c2, I need to take away these two squares from you so that you will have to go to c3. And if I try to take the c2 square away, then you can give me a check. Now, what happens if I were to force your rook to e1? Well, when I swing the rook over now and you go rook c1, I can play bishop here. Your rook can't stay on c1 because you have to make a move. It can't go to c2 or d1, so it would have to go to c3. And then our mission is accomplished, and we would move on to step two. So let's see what happens if black doesn't cooperate, if black plays rook e2. Right? We waste a move. 
very useful technique in the end game. When your opponent has his ideal defense in place, one of the questions that you should ask yourself is, what happens if I just you know, waste the move and, and throw the ball back in his court? What is he going to do? Oftentimes, when you have your dream position, the worst thing that could happen to you is to have to play again. Like you've, you've already peaked, right? So you kind of want your opponent to come at you at that moment. And that's when you sort of dodge and, uh, and let your opponent's position fall under its own weight. So after rook h7, only really two options in terms of moving the rook. We already know that rook e3 is basically what we want. Rook e1, we're going to look at in a moment. But what happens if black says, well, I don't want to waste a tempo with my rook. I want to move my king. Well, here it's very easy because this is checkmate in one move. Right? The bishop's very useful, taking away the escape square on f7. And what happens if king c8? This is trickier. It is white's move. So where does the black king go after rook to, a, uh, to uh, h8? Um, it goes nowhere, right? You have to block, and you also get mated. So you really don't have options. You have to move the rook. Uh, rook e8, again, loses to rook a7, or rook, yeah, rook a7. So you have to go rook e1. Now the rook swings over to the other side. Why might it be? B, might, might b7 be a better square than a7? Right? It would seem like the most normal move here would be to go, again, as far away as you can go. Right? I'm threatening checkmate, so we know what black's next move is going to be. Yeah? Oh, because if you're all the way over there, the rook can go to b1? Can go to b1? Well, but if you go, if you go to b1, I, I still have this check, uh, yeah. right? So the rook always has to go to the adjacent file to the king, because the king has to support the defense. So I have to play rook c1. So what would be the next step in, in luring? We've, we've done a pretty good job. We drove the rook to e8, then to e1, then to c1, and we want to get it to c3. So we're, we're, almost, we're almost home. Oh, you're not defending the bishop. Aha. Yes, sir. Right? If we play bishop here, now when black moves the rook to c3, we can't really play with as much freedom as if we had our rook on b7 protecting our bishop, because here black is threatening to take, black is threatening check. So the point of having the rook on b7 is to keep your bishop defended. And this is sort of the mindfulness that you need to have in endgames, where you need all of your pieces to work together. The rook swings over, but it has to have an eye on the bishop, right? The bishop needs backup too. In order for all of the pieces to work together, you know, the rook can't just cut loose and say, well, I'm doing my thing and, uh, you know, help out if you can and we'll meet at the finish line. No. So rook b7 is the key move. Uh, what if king c8 now? What if black resists, right, this idea? Yeah? Mm hmm right and this is going to be checkmate so all the pieces working together very nice and you're saying if I go rook d1 What's that? If he plays rook d1, rook a4. So if he plays, uh, you mean here rook d1, rook a4? Mm -hmm. mm. and, it, and if I, okay, that's a good idea. And if I go here? Right, if you go check, I still have this move, right? So here, actually, you can play rook a7. You're threatening checkmate in one move. 
So that pretty much forces black's hand to play rook b1. And now? Rook to a8, rook to b8, bishop to, um, what is that, f, f, no, uh, e, e6. King b7. Yeah, it's a slippery king. Yep. Bishop f3. Bishop? Bishop f3. And if I play rook b2? Yep. Okay. Here, here I think, I'm not sure it actually matters the square, but I go along the seven, it's like f7, b7, h7, and I'm grabbing. OK, so let's say rook, uh, rook h7. Yeah, and if king b8, then I just go rook h8, rook h8, rook h8. Rook h8. Excellent. Right, so now it turns out this rook is in trouble. I'm threatening checkmate. You can't go back because your rook's not able to block the check. Uh, if you give a check here, I'll just block it with the bishop. So the only move is king b8, check, king here, check. And this would normally be fine because the king escapes. But if not the for the skewer here where you lose the rook, exactly. So. So the tactics all seem to work out. So we have the, the sort of framework of the idea that black needs to always be able to play, which is to swing over with the rook from the E file to the C file. And the reason you can sort of see it, you know, if you read between the lines, these are the tactics that make that idea so necessary. So you don't actually need to know the tactics, you know, once you know the idea, but then once you understand the end game, you can zoom in and sort of check, okay, this is why that happens, and so on. So the rook has to go over to c1. So the next move should, is, is pretty hard, but I think since we've been talking about it, it's kind of, uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys can. Rook b2. What's that? Rook b2. Rook, rook b2? No, no, no. Yes, bishop b3, because we have to force this rook to c3. And, well, rook c3 is the main move. But again, let's ask ourselves, what happens, what alternatives does black have? Well, king e8 is not much of an alternative because you self-mate yourself. Uh, what about king c8 hitting the rook? This move makes some sense. Well, bishop d5, we're just going to end up repeating, yeah. yeah, repeating moves. Well, okay, but bishop d5 is the king move, then rook to uh, b8 doesn't do anything? Right. Well, remember this, everything is uh, is going according to plan for oh, black. Oh, it's right there. Yeah. Because okay. the bishop's no longer cutting it off, because mm -hmm. bishop Yeah. You can move your rook anywhere along the b file, okay. Well, I don't know if anywhere. Um, but let's choose one square and take it from there. Rook b6, okay. And uh, let's say I... Any other ideas? I saw some hands up in the back. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, here in the chat we have the suggestion of rook b4, which is actually the best move. I'm not saying the other moves don't win, but actually rook b5 would probably be the worst move because we're going to see that this bishop, we're going to get every last drop of play that we can out of this bishop, but in general in the end game, you have to do that. You have to get the most out of every one of your pieces, which is going to involve multitasking, right? Um, a lot of the times when you're in the opening or in the middle game, you can afford to have a piece slacking off, not doing anything. Because you have so many pieces that the other pieces can pick up the slack. You know, it's like, um, like, a, like a basketball analogy. You, you have five players, you can have four really good ones and one of them maybe not so good. Well, it kind of gets buried under the fact that you have four really good players. But in the end game, as you start simplifying the position, it's more of a one-on-one. -on -one. So 
you know, you've got nobody to pick up the slack. You've got to bring your A, a game. So you can't afford to have pieces idling. Uh, yeah, in the back. So the ratio for pieces to dice, pieces increases? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's that mathematical, but, you know, each position is different. So maybe you'll be able to get away with having a piece that's not as active as it could be. But in general, what you have to have is this mentality of always being alert for opportunities to bring pieces that aren't doing anything into the game, or maybe if it's a piece that's in the game that could be better, you know? Just always trying to improve the pieces and always trying to bring them all in. Don't get too focused on one single piece or two single pieces thinking, oh, I can just make it happen with these two. I don't need to, to get everybody in. So the move here is rook b4, which creates a very nasty threat. We're threatening bishop e6 check, followed by rook b8 and rook takes c8 checkmate. There's no check on d1, so the only move is for the king to go back. And now, how do we continue? All the blacks can't do is trade the rooks. Well, easier said than done. No. So actually, now we swing over to the other side. Right? So again, we're threatening checkmate. What would be the, the thematic move for black here? Rook e1. Rook e1, right? This would be the normal move. If king c8, what happens? Bishop d5. Bishop d5. We're renewing the threat of checkmate. The king can't go back because the rook is on the wrong file. Only move, king b8. And now? Rook a4. Rook a4. And now you're going to get mated here. And your rook can't make it in time to cover the check. You're just getting checkmated. So the rook has to go to e1. And now it is time for our bishop to blossom and show us its full potential. Yes? Way in the back. Was that a hand or was it a shadow? Very dark back there. Okay, never mind. Uh, any ideas? Bishop a4. Bingo. Now the bishop controls the check on d1, but it also takes away this key defensive square for the rook. So it disrupts your defense completely. <laughs> Wait a minute. Not done yet, right? I can still I can still move my king. Yeah. Bishop c6. This is so easy. Here. Bishop d5. And again, if I go king d8, I get mated. I can't play rook e1. I have to go king b8. And again, same idea. All right. And let's do maybe one more after bishop c6. Well, here. Again, right? Same thing. You're still going to get mated. And after check, bishop d5 just transposes, right? So after bishop a4, that's it. This is just a beautiful position that illustrates the essence of this endgame. You're getting the most out of your king. At the same time, you're getting the most out of your bishop, who is protecting your king's position, making sure it doesn't get dislodged from d6 by covering d1, disrupting black's defensive setup by covering e8, and then you're also getting the most out of your rook, constantly shuttling back and forth between king's side and queen's side. So this overwhelms black's defense and causes it to collapse. Now, I think we're finally ready to move on to the second part of this endgame. The easy part. This is the hard part, because this is the part that you actually have to understand. Uh, so instead of king c8, black says, OK, have it your way. I'll go to c3. What's the big deal about this? And the interesting thing about this position is that in order to win with white, we're going to need to employ three tactical themes. Triangulation, uh, one I don't remember, and 
a curtain. I'm going to remember it eventually, but I'm getting just so nervous. It's, with our millions of viewers here, it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, what's that? Eventually millions, for sure. Eventually? What do you mean eventually? I s this counter does not lie. Uh, yeah. So what we're going to try to do now that the rook is on c3 is we're going to try to dominate this rook so that once again this defensive setup that black has put together will not hold up. So uh, can anybody make a suggestion as to how you would continue here with white? Yeah? Okay, so let's say I do go rook d3. Bishop d5, and now I go back. Um, I'm thinking rook h, rook h4, and then if he goes to bishop c3, now you play bishop c4. And you gotta start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but actually here, maybe you have this move, right? Which is kind of the whole point of luring the rook to c3, that you're interfering with the defense, and the bishop is once again interfering with the defense of you know, the back rank, but also making sure that this king cannot be attacked. So in a way, it's the same idea as the bishop on a4 that we just saw. It's just adapted to a slightly different position. Yes, let's, let's say that it is. Uh, I still can't remember it. But um, yeah, it is interference, actually. So you have triangulation, curtain, interference. Those are the big three. Um, now, let's see. After rook b4, what happens if instead of giving this check, I just go back to c1 saying, oof, that was close. Let me get out of this troubling c3 square. How are you going to? Oh, and actually, I don't know what I'm doing. Why don't I go here, right? Same idea as, as the initial position, arguing that the, rook, the rook's ideal squares are e7 and c7. And I also have this idea now. Can you play bishop a4? Oh, I checked. Yeah. Oh, that still Yep. <laughs> well, I think here you kind of have to start all over again, but from the other side, right? So, so that's kind of frustrating. So I don't think the move rook b4 is the key. So actually, the first step, the first step is going to be triangulation. This, um, Oh, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't interference. You tricked me. You tricked me. It's, uh, it's the in-between move uh, to, to dislocate uh, the opponent's position. Um, so, and then the curtain is actually another word for interference. I didn't know that. I was wondering what the curtain was. Yeah, it's like you interfere, so you put, bring down like a curtain, I guess. Uh, yeah, I got, I got like a B minus <laughs> in that test. <laughs> So triangulation, right? The move is bishop e6, which seems like such a grotesque move because it creates the obvious threat of checkmate. So you're basically asking to get checked. But now after bishop d5, it turns out this rook is not particularly well placed, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to this position with white to move, right? Actually, we're trying to get to this position with white to move. If it was white to move, this would be an easy win. And we'll see why in just a moment. So the idea is, after bishop e6, you're forcing this check. And after bishop d5, you're hoping that black will play rook c3. And there you have it, right? And you really don't have much of a choice as to uh, rook c3, because again, this runs into checkmate. And your only real alternative is king to c8. And what do you do against king to c8? Go 
Go, I mean, your over there is my over, I had a. On the screen, that's what the A7. Here? Oh. Or here? I said A7. H7? And if, and if I go, if I go here, I don't really have much of a choice. Right, because now there's no rook on b1, right? So this idea of check, check, check really uh, doesn't, doesn't pay off as big. What's it um, Well, what would black normally want to do? Ah, this is why you don't want to be on the third rank, right? This is why c3 is bad, because the bishop from d5 is going to prevent this rook from dropping back to some critical squares to block the checkmate. So the leap of faith has paid off, and we're beginning to see why the third rank and the c3 square in particular is so problematic. So now there's just no stopping rook a8. So the rook has to go back to c3. So triangulation, check. Now comes the trickier part. And it's nice because they go in like increasing levels of difficulty, these, these tactical themes. So you got through the first hurdle. Now, the in-between move. It seems like everything is A-OK -okay for black, right? The defense is holding up. We've got the king here, the rook is ready to block the check, and the rook is also ready to swing over and block the check on the other side. As long as black can keep this up, black survives. Bingo. Rook d7. This is an incredibly annoying check, because now, wherever the king goes, the rook is going to have to uh, sort of hustle and, and say, wait, 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 let me, I'm not getting there in time, right? You, you went to the wrong side. For example, let's see again why the third rank is so terrible. If king e8, what do we do now? Rook g7, rook g7. beautiful. So now we're threatening checkmate, and uh-oh, the bishop is dominating the rook once again. So the, the reason that we wanted to lure the rook to c3 is because it's within reach of the bishop. If the rook were on c1 or c2, it would just be right out of the bishop's capabilities, right? So the rook would be able to swing over and maintain the defense. So no choice but to go to the other side. And here, rook a7. Again, the rook is dominated. Can't block the check. Um, well, actually, no, wait a minute. It can still go here. Yeah. Hold on. are testing me today. So rook a7 just repeats the position, right? We, the king goes back to d8, no problem. So I guess I can go on a7 and post king d8, send over c. OK, so let's say we go all the way here, only move. Yeah, you got it? Or not in this position, though. After King G8, he goes to C3. Um, I mean, no, 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 sorry. You saw back to C7. I mean, you can get that position, right? You can get yeah. even there, King G8, right? Right, so for example, check here, uh, Rook moves here. Right, so, so I mean, here you're threatening check and check, right? But I can still go King. King here and, and block. Oh, you want to keep going here? Oh, what am I doing? So here, here, you, what was your move? I was looking at bishop to um, e3, 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 e3. Right, and now check. check. Yes? Uh, here? The king goes back. Right? Can you play rook d4 in that position? Ah, very thoughtful. Uh, right? Rook b2 is a selfish move. 
is the rook doing, well, I'll do my thing, you go check, and then, you know, everything gets incommunicated. But rook b4 keeps in touch with the bishop, because now we're still threatening check, followed by checkmate, so black still has to go king d8, and now? Beautiful. Oh. The rook, this is the interference slash curtain, right? Because now the rook cannot access c8. We are threatening checkmate. There is no check on d3. Uh, and if the king goes back, then we give this check and checkmate. So Let's go back here. So we did the triangulation. Now we do the in-between move. And we finish the game off with the interference. So that's how you wrap up these three themes into one single uh, sort of sequence. And those are the two parts of the end game. I think that breaking it down like this makes it not only easier to know, which is really not the point. Yeah, you have a question back there? Well, you would just have to move everything one file, right? So for example, in the initial position, instead of having this, you would need like the king on e6 and the bishop on e5. So the beauty of this solution is that it works on all these files, actually. Um, I think it's a draw if you're on the knight files, and it might be a win, I don't remember, on the rook files, but it's a totally different solution. And it's really not so much fun. Yeah. Wait, wait, so what were you talking about? Like, um, the Carolina and Sigma? Yeah. Remember the, wasn't it the US Championship where he had, where, um, what's his name again? Gaillero, Gaillero, that game. He said Carolina and Gaillero. He had the one move to force a draw, but he got muted, but he got muted in that one move. Oh, I think I remember that. Yeah, I completely forgot about it. Uh, but that was with Gareev? Yeah, Karana yeah. And Karana lost that game? No, Karana won that game by, by one move. Because ah. he one move went to the king and then uh, he got checked. I thought that was, was Gareev Sevian. Gareev Sevian? I don't know. We're going to need our fact checkers here uh, to chime in because I vaguely remember that, that game. A few years ago at the US Championships, Timor was playing Gata. And he played the wing against <laughs> Anna Sicilian. Timor will do that. Yeah, and, and he put it on the board and got it to shut the head and started laughing. He just like, got <laughs> And what? he had to dig in, you know? Wait, how, what happened in the game? Uh, got a one. Oh, got a one. So, yeah, yeah. okay, well, so, mean, it, so he got, got away with it. it. It wasn't an easy reputation, you know? Yeah, well, I guess he didn't have an outburst uh, in, that, in that game. No, he just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> it was serious. Um, okay, so anyway, what I was saying about this endgame, and this is generally what I think is fruitful of studying endgames, is that it's not just about, oh, now if I get this, I know what to do. I mean, I've been studying this endgame for years. I've never gotten it in a single game, and it's, and it's not even a problem. Like, I'm not even sorry that I didn't get it. I would actually be afraid to get it because I, maybe I won't have time, and I'll mess it up, and I'll feel, I'll feel stupid because uh, I've seen it so many times. But really, it helps you think about you know, how to get your pieces to collaborate with each other. Now, this is a very difficult endgame from a theoretical point of view. I would say that it's only second to, is anybody familiar with the endgame uh, king, rook, and rook pawn against king and bishop? Yes. Oh, yeah, I, I drew that actually recently. You drew that? Yeah, I drew that again. With the rook and the pawn or with the bishop? With the bishop, yeah. Uh, it's harder to draw with the bishop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and... Um, I drew that against the bishop in my last tournament. Yeah, yeah and um, when you went into the game, like, when you went into the end game, yeah, on what rank was your opponent's rook pawn? It was on the, it was on the third rank. It was on the third rank, yeah, so, yeah. so he was actually winning. Wait, what? It's actually winning if it's on the third rank. Well, I mean, let's uh, actually let's put it on the board because this is the end game that I had in mind for next week's lecture. So this can 
can work as a little bit of an introduction. I'm trying to, I'm trying to ease you into this nightmare, this bear of an endgame. Uh, I had to play that endgame for like two hours, so. Well, it's easier to play it when you have the bishop. You just like. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had that endgame with the rook and the pawn, oh. and I was sweating it because, uh, uh, well, let's, uh, let's actually take a look. How do I do this? Board editor. Um, clear board. The really tough position is something like this. Uh, let's give black a bishop and a rook. And actually, oh, is this uh, is this right? I think. My my end game was the other was the other. Wait, so what was what was your end game actually? Uh, my opponent had I was white. I had a dark colored bishop. My king was like on a two or something. My bishop was on B my bishop was on B two. Yeah. And my opponent had a pawn or um my opponent's pawn was like on A four eventually went to A three later. And okay, but where was it and when you went into the end game, was it here or here at some point? Or did was it already there when you went into it? Already on A four Oh okay. So let's get, ah, oh, that's too many, too many, that's, that's easy, that's too easy. Anyway, let's say, you know, uh, whatever, just let's put a rook here and let's put a king here. This is an easy draw for white, yeah, easy, easy peasy. Uh, the, the trick is to avoid, advan avoid advancing your, your A pawn. The end game is a win if your pawn is at least on the fourth rank or farther back, right? So pawns on uh, a7, a6, or a5 is a win. Pawn on a4, a3, or a2 is a draw. You basically have no way of making progress as white. And actually, it would be interesting just to, to take a quick look at that, right, with the pawn on a4 and play it out just so you see how difficult this is, this is going to be. So. Let's see here, right? So it's white to move. Let's say I go check. <laughs> watch, watch you guys just win this easily with black. Oh, you. Oh, so you were on the wrong corner. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then, so then. Then it's maybe not so easy. Um, in any case, we'll, we'll come back to that. But basically, you can't break this fortress because, uh, well, I mean, here I'm, I'm very close to, to winning this pawn, right? So if you go here, I still can't go king a3 because of rook b3. So maybe that's still, that's still some hope. What's that? Can you play bishop b3? Bishop here? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I mean, I'll play this with white. I'll, I'll take anybody. Come on. Come at me. <laughs> Step right up. Who thinks you can, you can win this endgame? I'll find a way to lose it. Well, that's tough. I mean, <laughs> that would be impressive. <laughs> huh? You can, you can figure it out. Uh, if, you, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. I'll, I'll try it. Here. OK. And let's say, whatever, check. Here. And um, I guess I'll go here. King where? Here. Already, I might start thinking. Wait, could, you, uh, could you push the pawn if the rook's on there and then play rook b3? Rook b3. So here? Yeah. Okay, let's say I keep moving my bishop. Rook b3. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you're in the. Because if you go here, that's very cute, but I'm going to take the pawn <laughs> instead of the rook. You're in the wrong corner, though, right? Like for, the, for rook versus bishop. I don't, it probably doesn't matter. 
I'm in the perfect corner as, as white because this bishop covers this square and I can, you know, I can just. Are you sure that the pawn prevents you from winning? Because I've never seen it. I'm sure this is a position of your queen. You can give me the pawn, I'll take it. We can get whatever position you want. This is a draw either way. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, no, you're right. Actually, I don't know what I was saying. Yeah, but I don't know. Can you actually take advantage of that here? I don't know. Probably not. Because you're right. Technically, the good bishop would be the light square bishop. So that's even easier. Yeah, that's how it oh. is. I'm always trying to challenge myself. <laughs> ah, I didn't even realize it sometimes. Um, yeah, but I think even this position is probably a draw. I don't know. I would have to check that, actually, because now. Yeah, exactly. Rook to the bishop, because in the fight, you know, it gets in the corner. Yeah, the yeah that's, that's, uh, that pawn's not going anywhere. Okay. So. This is my understanding of this endgame, and it'll be sort of the, the intro because I want to spend the next lecture really getting into the nitty gritty stuff when the pawn is actually on the fourth rank. Usually, the farther back the pawn is, the easier it is to win because you need to be able uh, to do two things. And let me just set up one more position. Is the pawn kind of providing a white king cover? So, so let's say the end game that I'm familiar with, I'm going to change this a slightly, would be something like this. And I think is it, yeah, I think it is the, the light square bishop. So the problem that you need to solve as white is that you need to do two things simultaneously. You need to keep this king cut off. You can't let this king reach uh, the h-file because then it's a fortress. And you need to get your king out of the way. The problem is there's no good way of doing both things at the same time because when you, get, when you try to get your king out, you allow the black king back in. So, so this is the logical problem that you need to solve. And there's some very deep ideas in order to do this. And it all has to do with how advanced this pawn is. So anyway, I don't really want to give it away, but I do want to give you a little taste so that you'll come back next week. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's basically what I, what I had uh, to show you uh, for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it serves as a good introduction for our discussion on endgames. And also, even if you don't come back next week, hopefully when you come across an endgame, you'll start thinking about it. You know, you'll look at, you'll play over a solution, and you'll be like, okay, let me put this into words. And then let me see how each piece interacts with the other one uh, in the correct solution. And that way, you know, you'll you'll realize what the essence of the endgame is. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Can you repeat that? So, like, if it's king and pawn versus king and two knights, yeah. knights That's actually not, a, not such a hard endgame. And the best explanation I've seen of that endgame is on Wikipedia. Um, because it shows you a diagram of where the pawn needs to be blockaded for it to be a win. And it has a special name. Uh, I think the, the guy that solved it. What, what endgame is that you're talking about? It's the two knights against pawn, okay. where where you need to, well, technically with two knights you can't, you can't checkmate. But if white has a pawn, you can sort of stalemate him in time so that he has to start moving the pawn and then your other knight comes marching in and you give like this cool checkmate. And the pawn has to be on the board. I remember there was a high profile game that happened not too long ago, maybe a couple of years ago. I know Hans Niemann won this endgame in the pool against the... Oh yeah? Yeah, well, Hans Niemann, he's like the Chuck Norris of chess, you know. It's like the... <laughs>
the other day, I mean, uh, I think they were interviewing him and they're like, you know, you, everybody's pretty rusty, you know, we haven't been playing. He's like, no, nah, I'm fine. Uh, well, yeah. It's like, when, 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 when there's no chess, chess gets rusty. I don't get rusty, you know, that kind of. But, but he said he, had, was it Cheka, went to Europe and played, and they were able to go country to country with their COVID passport. Oh, uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. so, okay, yeah. so that's. Was it Cheka? I don't know. It was Hansi he somebody. He played a lot. He played, he played in Europe. Yeah, no, no. I mean, he was, he was in good form. He played really well in the U.S. Junior, so. Uh, Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, um, it all has to do with how far advanced the pawn is because you basically need some time for your knight to get back into the into the action once you've sort of stalemated the king, and and white can't queen and bring the queen like to the defense. So basically, when when white plays queen, you need to play knight checkmate. And uh, for example, if the pawn is too far advanced, you only have like three tempi. It's no good. Usually, I think the pawn needs to be blockaded on the sixth or fifth rank at the most advanced, right? If it's on the fourth, then it's already a draw. Did yeah. You have like a setup which shows like uh, which which pawn you need to be on which rank. To Actually, uh, let me let me just pull that up on Wikipedia uh, because it has a really helpful diagram. So two knights versus pawn. End game. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is the the Trotsky line. This is basically where you need to blockade the pawn on each on each file in order to be able to win. So um, you know you can actually maneuver with your king and knight as long as you keep the pawn blockaded here. For example, if your opponent has has an a pawn. You can actually get away with, with it being pretty advanced. If it's a B pawn, not so much, and so on. So I think this is a, a pretty useful diagram that gives you an idea you know, when you're going to be winning or not. Um, so, so see, here the, the pawn is blockaded on G6. So pawn is blockaded on G6. It's a win for white. And uh, yeah, I guess the most dangerous ones are the rook pawns and the center pawns. Uh, those, well, actually, the least dangerous one. Right? Because technically, if you blockade these with a knight here, 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 you're still winning. 